Hello and welcome to Forbidden Talk, where we explore sensitive social issues in the Middle East. This week we shall be discussing the subject of disability and the way it is perceived in the Middle East, and what are the challenges that must be overcome to move beyond the stigma associated with it. Disability occurs in many forms, whether it be physical, cognitive, mental, sensory or emotional, sometimes a combination of all. A disability may be present from birth or occur during a person's lifetime. And despite the international positive image promoted at the 2012 Paralympic Games, there is still need for a better understanding and engagement with the issue within the Middle Eastern society, regardless of the religion of the indiv individual over there. We'll be covering these topics and more, but first I'd like to welcome our studio guests, Amar Alam, research psychologist, and Ahmed Sarouk, Chairman of the Association of Muslims with Disabilities in the UK. Thank you both for joining us in the studio. Thank you. But before we get into this, let's take a look at this brief report. Social acceptance, employment and marriage are a few of the challenges faced by people with disabilities in the Middle East. Underdevelopment and the lack of resources in many of the Arab countries have had an impact on the prevalence of disability in the Arab region and the way disability is approached. According to Medical Aid for Palestine, over 87% of Palestinians with a disability are unemployed and one-third of them will never be able to get married. Over one-third of Palestinians with a disability have never been to school, whilst many do not use public transport as it is not adapted sufficiently. The vast majority of disabled people in the Arab world do not have the chance to seek treatment abroad, and the care available in their home countries can often be lacking. Earlier this year, the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia published a report, Disability in the Arab Region, an Overview, in partnership with the League of Arab States, in which it found out that disability prevalence rates among the Arab countries ranged from 0.4% to 4.9%. Substantial progress has taken place at the policy level as overarching institutional and legal frameworks related to disability have expanded significantly over recent years and persons with disabilities in the Arab region continue to experience limited access to employment opportunities and quality education than their peers without disabilities. Certain groups such as women with disabilities appear to face additional barriers to participating in social and economic life, especially in accessing education and employment opportunities. Though there has been progress in change of attitudes, people with disabilities still face isolation and challenges in their everyday life. Firstly, Ahmed, um, in light of what was raised yesterday um, about Cameron rejecting calls to sack Tory welfare minister Lord Freud, uh, as he was caught saying disabled people are not worth the minimum wage, what do you have to say in response to that? Well, uh, it is, it's a straightforward. This word is uh, discrimination of disabled people. Uh, I know myself, we have a few colleagues they are in a wheelchair and they are limited what they can do. And some of them, they are professional, accountant and auditor. Uh, by raising that point, to me, is just uh, discrimination. So it's a bit of ignorance on, Absolutely. on his behalf. Yeah. Yes. And, um, and I think that, that the fact that he apologized today, apparently, it doesn't really do kind of, um, it's still not, just because it kind of still plays into this negative kind of perception of disabilities you know kind of um it kind of plays into the stigma that I was about you know, to pick up on that I mean, in, in terms of stigma yeah i mean who has it worse is it those with a, with a mental disability or a physical disability so it's um, kind of the visible versus the non -visible. i think at the moment with physical disabilities it's it's something that is more acceptable in society whether it's in the uk or whether it's in the middle east because it's something that has been discussed over a number of years but with mental disabilities it's been hidden for such a long time that i believe that m mental disabilities um, or people that suffer from mental disabilities suffer far worse discrimination and there is more stigma attached to it. Okay, because you wrote Muslim Ignorance about Intellectual Disabilities. Of yes, paper. I have. Yeah. Um, what prompted you to write this? Um, I've been working with children uh, who suffer from intellectual disabilities for about four or five years now. 
And I've personally seen children um, suffer discrimination. I mean, I've, I've seen uh, there was one case of a woman who spat at a young disabled child. Um, I've seen people stare at disabled children just because they're different to them. Um, and as a result, I did some research and I've kind of done academic research in this area and I found that this wasn't a kind of single uh, isolated incident. This is kind of, this is quite widespread. So I focused my research on Muslims because being a Muslim myself, I felt that this is something that I should be kind of um, making my own community aware of. So I spent time um, researching and writing an article about the misconceptions that exist towards intellectual disabilities uh, within the Muslim community. Would you agree, Ahmed, on, I, you I know, totally, from your experience? I totally agree. Uh, I was, <coughs> sorry, I was working for National Health for 27 years. Mm. And really, truly, when you are, I mean, I'm talking in my, in my own experience. I used to visit the wards and see disabled, see ill people, but you don't feel it until it's happened to you. Disability awareness, I don't think uh, uh, in, in Arab worlds or Muslim worlds, I, they, they, they can see a disabled person, uh, but they don't know what day is having. Every minute for a disabled person, it become a day. A day, it become a week. A week, it become a month. It is very difficult okay. to make understand what is disability unless you experience it. Of course, of course. And um, Amar, uh, how, how is mental illness traditionally perceived in Islam? Because you've spoken quite yeah, a bit I about Yeah, I mean, this. the thing with disabilities and mental illness is actually seen in a positive light, especially in Islam. So, for example, um, during the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his companions, they were treated in the best way possible. So, for example, in society in the UK and in the Middle East, um, inclusion of disabled people isn't as prominent as it should be. But during that time, the Prophet, peace be upon him, made certain um, obligations on certain disabled people just so that they would feel included in society. So are we more backwards now? Yes, we are. I think we then. are. Yeah, of course. I think that because Muslims have kind of adopted a very cultural um, understanding and have, and have uh, taken their kind of religious views and kind of put them to the side. Because if we look to the, the, the example of the Prophet, peace be upon him, um, one of his companions who was blind, um, mm. he asked him, do I have to go to the mosque to pray? And this was um, Abdullah ibn Maktoum. And he asked him, do I have to go to the mosque to pray? And the Prophet replied, can you hear the adhan, which is the, uh, the call to prayer? And he said, yes, I can. So he said, you must go to the mosque. Now, <clears throat> sorry, that may sound harsh to some, but there was a reason why. Because if, for example, he was told to go to the mosque, that would make him feel like less of an outcast in, to in integrate society. In That's it. Yeah. So though the inclusion, I mean, the Prophet, peace be upon him, understood this. And so he made certain rules um, obligatory upon people with disabilities solely for their benefit. Okay, I think this is a good moment to go to our Skype guest, Patrick Corrigan, Distinguished Professor of Psychology at the Illinois Uni Institute of Technology. Patrick, can you talk a bit about your paper, Mental Health Stigma in the Muslim Community? What prompted you to research this specific theme in the Muslim Community? 
Well, our group has been very interested in the stigma of mental illness and how it undermines opportunities of people with mental illness for years. <clears throat> and some of our work as a result suggests that stigma changes by cultural and religious group. And what we realized in the literature is people mostly are looking at cultural groups in terms of ethnic populations. I'm largely uh, European populations and African American, and there really was no work um, looking at, from a research standpoint, what is the stigma of mental illness amongst Muslims. And can you talk about your findings in Turkey? You mentioned that fathers are blaming mothers for giving birth to children with mental Ill illness, and there's a shame factor that some children are locked in their houses. <laughs> yeah, again, we need to put it in perspective. This is one small group. We, um, I think a general rule about stigma is we don't want to take these findings and think it applies to everyone. Yeah. But what you find in some cultures, in this case, um, in Turkey, are groups of people, uh, uh, parents, uh, fathers who believe their child born with mental illness are stained by mental illness and worse as a result. Um, there's also some findings in Muslim cult cultures in India that if a young man or a young woman is known to have a mental illness, the family of a potential suitor will turn away from them. Um, in fact, that might stain the whole family, so there's also research that suggests that if a mother or father has a mental illness in a Muslim family in India, that their children will be staying with mental illness and other people in the area won't want to marry them. Yeah, so, um, and Amar, I wanted to bring you into this as well. I mean, you've both focused on the Muslim community in these, in these articles, um, but this is much more of a cultural and social issue across the, the whole of the Middle East. I mean, regardless of religion, it happens among Christians, Kurds, Arabs, Persians, Turks. Um, so why, why have you, you know, concentrated on the, uh, the, the Muslim community? I mean, the one thing that I wanted to kind of make clear is this isn't a Muslim issue. The fact that I wrote about this issue um, um, focusing on the Muslim community is because of the fact that I'm a, that I'm a Muslim mm. myself. So it's something that I felt that my community should be aware of. And you know, this issue happens in all cultural um, communities and, and it's something that we all have to kind of uh, make people aware of and this was kind of just my um, opportunity to do that. Yeah. Patrick, um, how do we overcome this idea of otherness? <clears throat> Good point. What our group's been very interested in is how to fix stigma. Um, one of the interesting things we find out is what does, seems not to work, which is education. Um, that research suggests the world knows a lot more about mental illness than we did 20, 30, 40 years ago. And yet the stigma clearly seems to be getting worse. Um, what we do know works pretty well is um, what some people might call contact, is meeting people with mental illness and having them tell their stories of recovery. And um, you also want to have it come from a similar population. So Muslims with mental illness have more credibility in the Muslim community in telling their stories. So I think the secret to erasing stigma is for generally for courageous men and women to disclose their stories of recovery and success which is by the way the rule of serious mental illness and not the exception. And why do you think people feel so awkward approaching the subject of disability? Um, disability or psychiatric disability, you know why psychiatric disability is particularly awkward is part of it is if not for the grace of God, there go I. And so I think everybody struggles in their life with depression or anxiety and feel like they can pull themselves up by the bootstrings. What's wrong with these mentally ill folks? Um, sort of an under, a lack of understanding that disability is a reality just like a physical disability or, or a sensory disability. And on what grounds do we judge people and feel them to be inferior or superior? Well, I think the one thing to keep in mind is that's endemic to the human soul. That right now in the Western world there's this horrible thing of, of uh, Westerners viewing Muslims as inferior. Um, and so that's the same sort of process that's going on for people with mental illness, without mental illness. It's people that are different than we are are bad. 
Would you have anything to add to that? No, I um, think that's, I mean, I feel the same way. You know, that there's, um, you can kind of focus on a certain cultural group or a religious group, but it doesn't mean, and I think focusing too much on a particular group, people may end up thinking that, you know, this issue is kind of um, isolated to that group. But in reality, dis disability, stigma, discrimination is actually uh, prevalent in all cultures. And that's something that we have to not kind of um, ignore. And, and Ahmed, anything to add to that? Well, uh, yeah, uh, what, have, what, have, what have has been said is, is quite right. But through my experience, a lot of Muslims, <coughs> They do care for each other. They do not like outside help. They do care for their mother, their father, their son, their daughter. But as it's been said, culture is a culture. It's a different culture. So, but as far as I know, I'm a Muslim. As far as I know, everybody uh, uh, feel ill in the family. They do take care of them. I am myself. I don't care for my wife. I have no care. Yeah. I don't need anybody from outside. Uh, but culture is a different thing. Yeah, yeah. And Patrick, um, should imams and priests and sheikhs play a greater role in helping change the stigma, or is it a, is it a private matter? No, absolutely. No, absolutely. You know, one of the things we get confused about is we think because this is mental health and disabilities, we think this is a health and medicine issue, and it's not. It's a social justice issue. And just as we want imams and other faith-based leaders to address the, the wrongness of racism and sexism and ageism, so they can play a very important central role in, in erasing the stigma of mental illness. Okay, thank you very much for your contribution, Patrick Corrigan, Distinguished Professor of Psychology at Illinois Institute of Technology. Thank you. And so, um, what about men and women? Are they treated equally in terms of disability in, in your experience? I mean, Ahmed. Okay, well, uh, 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 in my organization, we run a drop-in center, which you cater from five, year, five years old to 95 years old. Uh, the woman is treated by women, and the man is being treated by men. Uh, but they're all in one hall. They just sit separately. But the, uh, uh, to cater, we cater for equal. Man and woman, they're all equal. There's no different. Um, can I just add that this isn't something uh, that is kind of um, exclusive again to one group. I mean, working for a charity that helps uh, children with intellectual disabilities, which is a Christian charity, um, just solely for safeguarding issues, um, female staff have to work with, or um, when it comes to kind of more private issues, they have to work with female um, children and males have to work with males. Mm -hmm. So it's not kind of uh, something that is kind of exclusive to Muslims or kind of, you know, Islam. Uh, this is something done for safeguarding issues in the UK. And what do you think fuels the ignorance of disability? Uh, there's a number of things. I think that um, lack of awareness is the one major issue that um, causes and kind of um, perpetuates stigma. And what happens is if you don't understand something, you end up applying your own understanding to it. So, <clears throat> for example, in the South Asian community, and the Muslim community, they tend to apply a very supernatural understandings of um, of disabilities. So, for example, uh, one of the major kind of reasons that most, or sorry, quite a few um, South Asians think causes disabilities is possession. You're cursed. Yeah, you know, yeah. evil eye and. Yeah. <clears throat> issues like that, but it's not, you know, um, disabilities are caused by biological factors, you know, so things like um, uh, problems at birth, genetic reasons, illness, um, problems with the brain. 
but uh, this is something that isn't known by uh, most people, and so they pl apply their own understanding to this. So, yeah. Very interesting. We've got to uh, <coughs> move on. Over on Skype now is Rula Helu from Beirut, poet and journalist, who is a paraplegic and confined to a wheelchair following a car accident. Rula, could you tell us a bit about your disability? How many years have you been in a wheelchair? Uh, first of all, hello to you and uh, your guests, uh, and the greetings from Lebanon. Uh, I uh, had a car accident when I was four years old. I was in the mountain, in the mountain, uh, and uh, I became paralyzed. Uh, and uh, my family gave me all the support when the accident happened, and after the accident also. Uh, I was so young. My mother took the books to the hospital to teach me, and my father also did the same thing. Uh, I went uh, to a school which is uh, not only for people with disabilities, it is for other people, and I was the only uh, child on the wheelchair in the school. And that was a nice experience with respect to me because it uh, teach me a lot. And, and the other children, were they, were they also kind to you in that situation, being the only one in a, in a wheelchair? Uh, uh, you know, uh, honestly, it was uh, strange for the kids there in the school. And uh, uh, they treat me sometimes bad and sometimes good. But uh, my family uh, gives me all the protection and the teachers in the school was so good and nice. And also the boss in the school was very nice with me. Uh, this makes me uh, strong and happy. Even sometimes they laugh at me or sometimes, but not all the students was like that. Uh, this relates to the society. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, I was happy with my disability, first of all, because I am a believer. I believe in God yeah, and believe that I have a mission in this life. This is very positive. And I believe that I... Yeah, you're very inspiring. <laughs> uh, what, what, yeah, what do you yeah. do? I, I think you, you have your own show, don't you? Can you tell us a bit about that? Uh, what? What do, what do you do? Uh, you're a journalist and you present your own show. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, I work as a journalist from 17 years ago. Uh, I write in many newspapers and magazines in Lebanon and in the Middle East. I write an issue not only about disability, and I write about disability to show the society the positive side of people with disabilities that they can improve themselves and they can make a positive change in the society, even in the even that the society sometimes put for them for blocks and sometimes the, it make a big discrimination for people with disabilities. Uh, with respect to my program, with respect to my program, it, uh, it was the first program in Lebanon that uh, talked about people with disabilities. Oh, I see. It was, uh, yes, it, uh, it uh, was in Arabic, it means that we are equal and uh, we can uh, get married, we can play sports, we can travel, we can live and love, we can be equal to others in all aspects of life. So this is a really positive step in Lebanon because you're, you're encouraging um, debate, you're encouraging you know, the, the issue to be talked about. Yes, yes. But you know, even that Sometimes, you know, most of the people, they need a big change in their mentalities because 
they treat the people with disabilities that are not equal with others or they are really disabled they can can do anything uh, especially in work or sometimes they refuse people to work in some uh, institutions or in the government or in many places and this is a big in discrimination i think because people must know the effort of the people with disabilities how, how can be strong and uh, uh, they have their self defense and they have strong uh, personalities they can uh, they are smart they can give from all from their heart You've also experienced discrimination. Uh, there was an incident last year at Beirut International Airport and your story attracted a lot of media attention after this incident. Can you tell us more about what happened on that day? Uh, yes, this was the, the first news in Lebanon. Every, uh, tele, all the televisions talked about that and the newspapers and the, uh, that was uh, very bad with respect to me. I was traveling to, to Egypt for uh, uh, a thought uh, because I want to sign my book there. And uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, people who work in the airport uh, told me that uh, you can't travel now because you are disabled and you can't travel alone. I told uh, him uh, that uh, I travel myself and I'm independent. I don't need any help in the plane. He refused and shouted to me. And uh, after a few minutes, I see all the luggages beside me. And uh, you are out of the plane. You, can, you can't go as other people are traveling. That was very bad with respect to me. It was really a big, big discrimination for a well-known person as me. All the people here know me and I am famous and I, I can do everything alone. So why you treat me like that? Uh, I go through the media because I am a journalist, first of all, and I am disabled. And that is the importance of the issue because some people who are uh, disabled can't do the same thing that uh, I did. Absolutely. That time because some of them, they feel afraid or they... Yes, yeah, so you missed your flight, Rula. And, uh, you missed yes. your flight. I mean, did they offer you any apology? I mean, that must have been a very humiliating experience. Uh, you know, I didn't travel with them anymore with this... Uh, 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 with the, yes, the MEA airlines, so I travel with other airlines, uh, but... Uh, Did they apologize, Rula? Uh, uh, yes, I asked them only to apologize, and they refused. They refused? And they wrote, yes, they refused, and they wrote uh, in their website and other websites that Rula Hello want to be famous and want money that was she was pretending that uh, she is nervous and crying it was really funny with respect to me and i don't care because they are these people uh, must learn a lot from this experience absolutely and it's good you have a a, a good sense of humor about it i'm not sure everybody would be as uh, as humored as you <laughs> Uh, but yes. I believe you recently got married. Uh, tell us about that experience, would you? No, no, I didn't. No, uh, I'm a single I person and, uh, and I'm happy in my life. Uh, uh, and uh, every person have uh, his own life and private life. Uh, and the people with disabilities, they can live and get married and love and be independent in their own life uh, and this is not strange because we are a human being and we can also give birth 
we can be equal i can be a mother and others absolutely uh, absolutely yeah. uh, that must have been a rumor but uh, <laughs> sorry about that but it was so wonderful to speak to you thank you ruler helu poet and journalist and thank you for inspiring us all thank you and uh, hope we will make a good change in the middle east and especially in lebanon for people with disabilities and make the, the our uh, nation special with the new uh, changes like make the country accessible for people with disabilities thank you thank ahmed thank um you. does your association receive any aid and who are the the, the main donors well <coughs> it's funny you brought that uh, we used to have a, a project, a couple of projects. Uh, it's been ended, one of them been ended last, last year, and one was, actually both of them was end last year. At the moment, we have no income. No income? No income whatsoever. There is, uh, there is, uh, uh, we did, have, we do have a sort of like a standing order. So there is maybe four or five people who is donating five pounds a month. However, I mean, the organization is still going, still operating exactly where it was, except with this number, mm -hmm. what we used to you know, help. Uh, the drop-in center is still the same. We have just celebrated the Eid last Saturday, and there's quite a few people turn up, and a few guests as well, uh, without any funding. Most of the, the, uh, the activities is being provided by myself and others who donate. For example, somebody might bring a bag of rice and somebody might bring something else. But we, our attention is, is just to go forward. We hope one day, initially, initially myself, I'm the founder. Yes. But what I had in my mind that time, I went through, because I was able body, uh, I was a business person, I worked for National Health, I worked so on and so on. Uh, initially, I was hoping to go along, maybe a year, a year and a half, and I'd be, be one of the users. But it never happened. Okay. <laughs> I'm 21 years, I'm still here. <laughs> That's a good thing too. Yeah. And um, what are the recurring issues that yeah. those with disabilities you meet complain about? Are they talking about the same sort of things, the lack of support systems or well, funding? Uh, or? Yeah, lately, the most problem what we are facing is with the local government. Uh, the local government almost is, well, to me, is 70% is all went out of the window. So we apply for something, you won't get it. And that put us in a very, very difficult position. Uh, so there is, no, there is no funding from nowhere. What about the United Nations? Is there no, no funding well, from them or yeah, the our, EU? I mean. Yeah, our organization is named the Association of Muslim with Disability. Uh, it's not only our name. We are physically disabled and financially disabled. At the moment, if you don't have finance, you can't go forward because yeah. there's no manpower. So what we do is purely, purely, purely volunteer. That's what we do. Uh, and most of us, actually, as a trustee, we have experience. Some of them, actually, they are disabled themselves. Some of them have experience the disability. Uh, and this is why we keep carrying on, because we know what disability means. I mean, I, you know, when I see somebody in a wheelchair, I know what he's going through. But before, I don't know. So now your awareness... I am very you. aware what a disabled person is going through. And what have they said they are going through? What do they tell you? Well, the difficulty in, 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 in personal life, mm -hmm. in public life, in so many ways. You know, in, well, in their welfare, uh, so this is what we came, we, we came, we, we, we do help them in, in, in adaptation, for example, equipment, okay. which we do, you know, uh, fight on their behalf. That's what and bringing we them together. Yes. yes. And what do you think uh, should be done right now to 
to help promote change? I think that at the moment, I mean, in the UK, the government has kind of, um, they do have policies that are in place to improve inclusion of people with disabilities. But I think at the moment, not enough is being done. And I think that um, more awareness needs to be created about this issue. And, um, and this could be done in, in a number of ways, depending on the community. Um, you know, um, but overall, I think more people need to start talking about disabilities, and it's not being di discussed enough. Mm -hmm. You know, a documentary once every six months about disabilities on on Channel Four isn't really going to change much. You know, th this has to be frequent uh, to kind of help change the perception of disabilities because it's. Um, it's nothing negative, you know, it, people don't have to feel shame about being disabled. Um, and then, you know, people don't have to f feel as if it's something shameful, because it's not. You know, it's, it's a natural um, thing that people are going through. And, you know, to stop stigma, I think being around others who are disabled, being in contact with them, uh, reduces stigma. This is something that research has found. So, as Ahmed was saying, that you know, being around people who are disabled that reduces kind of d discrimination because people look at that human side of people that are disabled, and they don't see that label of disability. It's that they see that human side, and they realise that these people are no different to them. Mm -hmm. And so that's this is something that has to kind of um, happen and people have to be persistent in this issue for things to change, otherwise they won't change. Okay, well let's now move on to our next section, this brings us nicely to it. Um, how and what changes can be made to help people with disabilities in the Middle East? Though many countries in the Middle East are working on a number of programs to enhance the recruitment of persons with disabilities, many people still face challenges in terms of finding employment opportunities, particularly due to the cultural attitudes that persist in the workplace environment. There are groups who provide services to children uh, with mental and or physical disabilities like autism, uh, such as Sezobel in Lebanon and a help centre for disabled children in Saudi Arabia. But, I mean, do you think work needs to be done in terms of catering to disabled children? Yeah, I think it does. I think, especially with uh, the educational programmes, I think they aren't up to scratch. Um, I mean, there's a number of things that can be improved. You know, uh, firstly, as we discussed earlier, creating awareness, uh, better educational programs f for kids, mm -hmm. um, integrating disabled people into society. Because 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 at the moment, the stage that the Middle East uh, is in is kind of the inst inst institutionalized stage where um, dis disabled people are kind of pushed into kind of um, uh, housing and other areas where they're not part of society and that's something that needs to change you know they have to be more included in society you know being in schools and um, but the problem with this is there are a lack of professionals in the Middle East when it comes to diagnosing uh, people with disabilities and that's where um, one of the major kind of um, issues that people in the Middle East have to overcome. So, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. We have a guest over Skype now. With us now is Mehmet Hakan Elbir, founder of Dialogue in the Dark in Turkey, a social enterprise to help empower the blind. Mehmet, tell us about Dialogue in the Dark. What is it? Um, hello, first of all. Uh, to all. Um, Dialogue in the Dark uh, actually was created by uh, Mr. Andreas Heinecke, 
who is the founder of Dialogue Social Enterprise in Germany. Uh, in a simple way, Dialogue in the Dark is a platform uh, where participants experience darkness uh, and uh, blind people teach them how to see. Uh, the, the platform does not inspire pity, but instead uh, enables interaction and builds respect, understanding and even wonder by redefining disability as ability and otherness as likeness. Yes, and uh, what, what events do yeah. you hold? Uh, here, I mean, we opened recently this uh, exhibition uh, last December, and so far um, we organized some special seminars, uh, some uh, panels which are being constant, constantly developed and expanded. Uh, the understanding and revelations are deepened. Uh, we use these seminars to train school classes, students, companies, and especially human resource departments and executive teams trying to both change the way normal people think about and relate to otherness uh, and also increase diversity in their respective companies. Yes, you, I mean, your mission, as described on your website, seeks a change of perspective for the participants. Can you tell us more about that? Um, one of the exhibition's goal is to make use of the abilities of visually impaired people. Here in Turkey, people uh, ask me, are you doing something for the blind? I tell them, I do not do anything for them, but with them. This is really important. I believe every person has value. I actually think blindness may be a precious feature. We can learn something here from the communication we establish with the blinds. People who are visually healthy, sighted people I mean, get chance here to know themselves better. They realize the importance of trust and communication. The uh, exhibition will become a turning point in the life of its participants. Yes, and better senses as well. Um, and why, yeah. do you, what, why do you think people initially feel awkward about discussing disability and engaging with the disabled? Uh, actually, it's a big part of the society is not aware of people with disabilities. This project is important in changing this. Um, I strongly believe in a concept introduced by Martin Buber, an Austrian-born uh, philosopher, who said, the only way to learn is through encounters. This is how I learned, and I think all of us learn like this. I mean, experiential learning is a vibrant and deep exchange with others. It's easy, some people thought it was too complex, but uh, according to my experience, it's, it's really easy. And in Turkey, how visible is disability? Um, there are some challenges. Uh, you know, as in many countries has or faced. Uh, the, the interaction between abled and disabled people is often hindered by stereotypes, fears, avoidance and prejudice. Uh, the founder of uh, Dialogue in the Dark, uh, Andreas, uh, had his own eye-opening moment uh, when he noticed that someone's disability uh, was more of a problem for the people around him than for the disabled person. Uh, in different countries, there are different levels of uh, understanding, levels of support and levels of access for the disabled. Here in Turkey, uh, the physical needs of the disabled are generally well provided by the uh, government welfare. There are, for instance, schools for the blind and other programs for those with disabilities, but still only uh, about 50, 15% uh, have jobs. Uh, that's another point, of what course. What about public transport? Uh, buses kneel and have a place for uh, wheelchairs to be uh, secured in place. But, however, subways only have access in about, let's say, 20% of the stations. So there are still a lot that has to be done, actually. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Mehmet Hakan Elbir, for talking us with us today. It's a pleasure. Thank you.
Amar, did you do you have anything to to add to that discussion? That was quite interesting about how to, how they are engaging with the non-blind to yeah. help combat this this otherness factor. Yeah, I think that the that's really important because the thing is that if you don't get uh, people that aren't disabled to kind of want to uh, communicate and kind of be part of people who are disabled then you know people I mean these programs can do as much as they want but if people aren't interested then you know things aren't going to go forward and that's one of the reasons why stigma occurs is because people perceive others to be different to them and so if you can reduce that barrier um, by what they're doing it there in Turkey um, that will shift things in a very positive way so I think you know that's uh, excellent work that, that they are doing there yeah and Ahmed well, uh, from what I have heard, yeah. uh, I mean, Turkey is still a long way to go, but uh, I, be, I visit Turkey, but they are in a process going in the right way. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. they're in the right way to, yes. to changing yeah. things. And I was, I was quite shocked to hear that there's not much in terms of the, you know, professionals working there. But well, uh, Tur small steps, yeah, right? Tur Turkey, they are advanced than their neighbours. Most of them, as brother says, they haven't got the expertise there. So Turkey, I've seen Turkey. Turkey is is well advanced than the surrounding neighbours. Okay, now we're going over to the phone to Eli Ibrahim, CEO of Digisys, an information technology solutions provider based in Beirut. And he was shot in the 1990s and as a result has been paralysed and has been confined to a wheelchair ever since. Eli. Could you go back to that fateful day of the shooting and tell us what happened? Uh, I, could not, I, could, I could not get your answer. Could you just recall that fateful day of the shooting and tell us what happened? Okay, actually I was, uh, it was in the uh, early 90s. I, I was part of the organization team for the Automobile Club in Lebanon, the body of the FIA. Uh, we were organizing a, a rally, Rally of Lebanon in 94. And uh, one week previous to, to, to the rally, we simulate this rally. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a race without the cars. And on our way uh, during this, uh, this race, we were shot out. Uh, we were shot at, and the bullet hit me in the back on the chest level. And so your life changed in a moment. Can you tell us about the recuperation period? What was the health care uh, like you received? I was hospitalized in Beirut uh, the, for the initial surgery. Uh, after that, I traveled to, Belgium, to, uh, to Brussels in Belgium for, for my rehabilitation and stayed there for almost a month. And do you have a support group? Um, and did you have one? And do you have one, I should say? Support. Uh, I beg your pardon? Do you have a support group? Did you have a community no, to help no support. you? No, not, not, not such things in Lebanon. Uh, my only support group was my friends and family. Right. And do you feel, or did it hinder you professionally? Did it stop you moving on with your career? No, actually not. Actually not. I uh, I took challenge on myself, and uh, this was the good part I got from Belgium, where they gave me the the, the moral uh, thing of that. Uh, the first challenge for me was I went uh, on '96 to New York by myself with a couple of guys on wheelchair and did the marathon uh, in New York, and after that. Uh, a friend of mine uh, working in, uh, in uh, computer technology, uh, he offered me to, to work with him just, uh, just to try. And then I started. And on an emotional level, have you felt adequately supported? Uh, Emotionally, 
Was that just the support from your family? Yes, yes, it was the, uh, the only support I got was from my family and my close friends. So did your perception of disability change after the shooting? Your thoughts about the disability, did they change? Uh, no, actually not. No, you... you and how, vi how visible is disability in Lebanon? How, how, how easy is it? For you it's there. not easy at all. It's not. It's not easy at all because the the country is not equipped, or most of the country is inaccessible. Even uh, governmental institutions, public spaces are not accessible neither. Uh, only few uh, large uh, shopping malls uh, they have access. Uh, others, uh, no. So you would say disabled people are not treated equally. Uh, Yes, you're right with that. So what are the greatest challenges disabled people face in the Middle East? Uh, the, the major challenge is uh, trying to convince uh, the other people that uh, people on wheelchair are not aliens. Uh, because the children are not used to... because. You, mo since most uh, public spaces are, are inaccessible, so yes. it's unfrequent to, to find the disabled people on, on wheelchair uh, in the public. And uh, uh, the, the, the people uh, are not used to see um, guys on wheelchairs. Uh, this is the major, uh, the major challenge. Other than that, <clears throat> sorry, other than that, all the challenges reside in the uh, awareness that uh, should be among the uh, the community uh, because uh, uh, you know uh, as I told you in Lebanon I don't know about other Middle Eastern countries I've, I've never been there uh, most governmental institutions uh, are not accessible so if a guy on a wheelchair has to do anything he cannot well, and uh, total yes yes okay Thank you very much, Ibrahim, Eli Ibrahim, for, for telling us your story. Thank you for having me with you. Um, Ahmed, I wanted to ask you about um, this thing in Britain. I mean, ha has Britain gone too far in its political correctness uh, for, for disabled people, almost in a patronizing way? Well, the government, they have done something that was what ten between ten fifteen years ago they did pub publicize you know the the, the, the uh, disability and and, and awareness whatever it is. but it's been quiet since then for the last fifteen years something there's nothing there for a disabled they don't talk about disabled uh, as you know <laughs> disabled has been uh, has been suffering for the last couple of years when the law has been changed uh, a person has, has got a wheelchair and has got two rooms, he has to get out uh, or pay for that, for that uh, spare room. Would you agree? Um, yeah, I, I think to an extent. The government has tried to um, kind of deal with this issue with disabilities, but I think not enough has been done in the right way. Yeah. I, I mean, you can throw money at something, but if it's not done in the right way, then it's, you know, it's not p positive. It's actually negative because society may feel that you know you know things are getting getting done but in reality they aren't do you think sometimes um, no. the mentally disabled can fool the NHS can can um, this is a to take advantages yeah, of the benefits it's a very controversial issue but I think the issue with a question like that is people may just end up um, perceiving everyone to be like that and this is something that I think we have to be careful with you know there are people who do um, take advantage of the system yeah and you know and hopefully those people sh should be brought to justice but these very small small groups of people are are making it worse for people who are actually disabled and that's the worst part of it um, so 
overall, it does happen, but it's not as it's not as yes. widespread as people think. Anyway, we're not going to delve yeah. into their, yes, that's <laughs> their what I yeah. further. But um, yeah. the London 2012 Olympics was very positive. It um, was, yeah. uh, It was very positive in promoting better awareness. Um, and in your opinion, viewing its advanced system uh, in this regard, how can Britain help the Middle Eastern countries? I think um, this is something that the Middle Eastern countries need to reach out to the West for especially the UK, you know, there has to be more collaborations between organisations in the Middle East with uh, organisations that are based in the UK. So, and I think this is the way forward. Um, I, don't think, I, I don't feel as if um, there are enough experts, uh, doctors, therapists, who can deal with yeah. the issue of disability adequately in the Middle East. So they should bring um, experts from the UK and the West to the Middle East to kind of help them in that process. And actually I want to pick up on something you wrote and um, you said some cases those who are disabled can outdo their non-disabled peers. Yes. In, in different yeah. facets of their lives. Yeah. Could you give us an example of this? Um, there are cases of, for example, from an Islamic perspective, okay. um, there are cases where autistic children can memorize the Quran, right? The 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 religious Islamic book, um, um, in a way that normal people can't. And if you see um, autistic children reciting, uh, it's amazing. It's I mean, there, there's cases of um, the mental capacity of some autistic children far goes beyond what um, I can do, for example. Yeah. And yeah. so th that, that doesn't mean that's, you know, that's, that just means that they're programmed differently to me and to other non-disabled people. And Ahmed, uh, just quickly, how can we empower disabled people? Well, it's awareness yeah. um, by media, by words, by you know, in 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 our society, by mosque, which is we need to talk more about it. You see what's been happening. Uh, I'm just going to pick up in a word mm -hmm. about Middle East. Middle East, uh, when they have a disabled child, deaf or blind or physically disabled, they just get on with life. There is nowhere to go. Or there is nowhere to ask anybody for help. So what they, they just live normal life. Uh, well, I would say it's a normal life, but. Uh, they just get on with it because there is no help there and there is no uh, organization there to who, who can support them. But by going to the media all over, I'm sure there will be some connection with everybody. So it's better, better awareness is the key. Absolutely. Okay. As we come to the end of our show, we can see that although there is progress in attitudes towards people with disabilities in the Middle East, there is still a lot of work that can be done. Through education, empowerment and inclusion, we can move beyond the preconceptions and negative beliefs about disability, whether visible or non-visible. I'd like to thank, thank my guests today, Rula Helu, Professor Patrick Corrigan, Eli Ibrahim, and Mahmed Hakan Elbir, and of course, Amar Alam and Ahmad Serouk, who joined me in the studio. Join us again next time. <laughs>